Hello everyone, here is Dr. Venadosi. Today we will be studying the integumentary system. The integument is composed of two main layers. The cutaneous layer, which is also known as skin, and the subcutaneous layer, that, as you can expect, will be the layer underneath, sub, underneath the skin. The subcutaneous layer is what you also know as sub -Q. Now, the integument has these two main layers, and it includes everything that we find in these layers, such as hair, nail, skin glands, and also sensory receptors. One thing that I find very interesting is that our skin is the largest organ of the human body. And it is also often the most underrated organ of the human body. The skin is our first line of defense against external environment conditions. It has a very important role of protecting all the other organs that are within our body. Also, the skin has a role in protecting us from becoming dehydrated because it protects us from losing water to the external environment. So, protection is a very important function of the integument. If we are in a very hot environment, what happens? We start sweating, right? And the sweat is a way that our body has to cool us down. At the same time, if we are in a very cold environment, what happens? The hair in our skin stands up, and that's a way that our body has from protecting us from losing heat to the external environment. So, obviously, another function of the integument is temperature regulation. Now, if you ever had the opportunity of licking your sweat, because let's say you're running and a droplet fell into your mouth or something like that, you probably notice that sweat is not like water. It's a little salty, right? And that's because sweat is made by water and salt, so sodium and chloride ions, and some other components as well. But if you keep that in mind, you are able to remember that another function of the integument is excretion of substances. And if you think about the fact that you can put, for example, those nicotine patches on your skin, you have different drugs that you can put patches on the skin, and you have those skin products that you apply daily. So the day after, you are younger than the day before. You can recall that all those products that you're putting in your skin are being absorbed. Consequently, another function of the integument is absorption of substances. Now, when you touch something hot, you feel it. When you touch something cold, you feel it. If you enter a cold room, you feel it. You feel when someone touches your skin. You feel when someone holds your hand. Consequently, another function of the integument is sensory information. You are capable to sense the environment, the external environment. And lastly, but not less important, the integument is involved with the production of vitamin D. An important detail is that vitamin D starts being produced at the skin. But it just happens when we are exposed to sunlight. And then this form of vitamin D goes to the kidneys and become an active, very active form of vitamin D. Now, if we are not exposed to sunlight, we cannot produce this form of vitamin D that later on will become more active. And since people are not as exposed to sunlight as old days, what happens? Vitamin D deficiency became an issue. And what would be a very efficient way of delivering this first form of vitamin D to the population? You just add it to milk and orange juice, for example. That's why when you go to the supermarket, you see those juices and milk with vitamin D on them. 
So again, the integument has two main layers, the cutaneous layer, which is also known as skin, and the subcutaneous layer, which, as the name implies, is underneath the cutaneous layer, underneath the skin. Now, when we look at the skin, at the cutaneous layer, we find two layers. And the layers are the epidermis and the dermis. Now, guys, look at this. Epi means outside, right? So, you have the epidermis on top of the dermis. And the epidermis is the layer that is really in contact with the external environment. Now, if you go back to the lecture about tissues, you will remember that the epidermis of our skin has several layers of cells. And since it has several layers of cells, we call that stratified. Now, when we look at the layers of the epidermis, we see that the bottom layer of cells is more rounded. And as they go up, they become more like elongated, they become flat. And the top layer of cells is flat. And since the top layer of cells is flat, how do we call a layer of flat cells? We call that squamous. So, the epithelium that forms the epidermis of our skin has to be stratified squamous epithelium. Because in a stratified epithelium, what we need to include in the name is the shape of the top layer of cells. So, obviously, this has to be stratified squamous epithelium. What would be the importance of the epidermis to have several layers stratified, to have several layers of cells? It is very important to have stratification in the skin to resist external forces, right? So, that is a way we can resist friction. Now, if we just have several layers, and these cells are very soft and nice, that would be not very helpful. So, besides having several layers of cells, we also have in these cells a protein that's hard, that's very dry, and that would make our skin very resistant to friction and trauma, for example. And the protein that we find in the cells of our skin is keratin. So, since these cells have keratin on them, and we see a big increase of the amount of keratin protein when we look from the bottom of the epidermis to the top of the epidermis, we say that the epidermis is composed of keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Now, when we look at the layer that we have underneath the epidermis, which is named dermis, we don't have epithelium. We have connective tissue. Because if you go back to the tissues lecture, you will refresh your memory that epithelium does not have blood vessels. Because in the epithelium, the cells are very tightly packed together and there is no space for blood vessels. So, these cells in the epithelium must receive their nutrients from cells that are making up the underlying connective tissue. Consequently, the dermis is connective tissue, which is vascular. So, we do have lots of blood vessels in the dermis. And since our skin needs to resist tensile forces in all different directions, our skin is not just being stretched in one direction, it can be stretched in different directions. So, since our skin needs to resist tensile forces in all different directions, you can conclude that the connective tissue that's making up the dermis of our skin is irregularly arranged. So, in the dermis, we find dense irregular connective tissue. Now, in a very small part of the dermis, we also find loose areolar connective tissue. And I'll mention that in a few slides, but what I really want you to remember is that the dermis is composed of dense irregular connective tissue, since it needs to resist tensile forces in all different directions. Now, when you go underneath the dermis, you are not anymore in the cutaneous layer, you're not in the skin anymore. Then you are in the subcutaneous layer. And the subcutaneous layer 
is where you find fat, adipose tissue. And as you learned in the tissues lecture, adipose tissue is another type of connective tissue. You also find the subcutaneous layer areolar tissue. But my main focus here is for you guys to remember that the subcutaneous layer has adipose connective tissue. Adipose connective tissue is fat, in other words. And why would it be important for us to have fat underneath the skin? That is very important because it serves for us to not lose heat to the external environment. And also, it is a very good way of cushioning all that's inside of our body. So, in places of our body that we have more adipose tissue, we have more cushioning, right? You can feel it very soft. And that's because of the fat that we have underneath the skin. Now, think with me. We have the dermis made of connective tissue, right? Now, if the dermis layer becomes thinner, what will happen? You will have the adipose connective tissue closer to the epidermis, right? Close to the surface of the skin. And fat, adipose tissue, doesn't have much of a shape, right? And that is what gives us the appearance of cellulite. Because in cellulite conditions, what happens is that the dermis became thinner than what it was. And then the adipose tissue that is underneath can really show its non-shaped structure at the surface of the skin. How wonderful. Now you know how this looks like. In our human anatomy lab, we have two main skin models. This is the image of one of the models, and soon I will be showing you the image of the other model. And I believe it's very useful if we go over the different layers of the integument and the structures by using models that you will be exposed in the lab as well. So, the integument is composed of two main layers. The cutaneous layer which is also known as skin, right? And the subcutaneous layer, that is also called subq. Now, the cutaneous layer, or skin, is subdivided into two layers, right? We have a top layer that is named epidermis, and underneath the epidermis, we have a layer that's named dermis, right? So we have the epidermis and the dermis forming the skin, the cutaneous layer. Now, we know that the epidermis, which is the top layer of the skin, is made of several layers of cells. And you can see them here, several layers of cells. And since we have several layers of cells, that is called stratified. Now, the top layers of cells, you can see that the cells are flat, and that is what we call squamous. Now, we know that these cells, as they go towards the surface of the skin, they have lots and lots of keratin inside them, and we need to state that in the name of the tissue, so the name of the tissue that we find in the epidermis of our skin is keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Now, epithelial tissue is characterized by cells tightly packed together. There is no space for blood vessels. And if you look at this model, you can really see that the epidermis of our skin does not have blood vessels. All blood vessels are found underneath the epidermis. They are found in the dermis, which is not epithelial tissue. The dermis is composed of connective tissue, and the great majority of this connective tissue is dense, irregular connective tissue. And we also have blood vessels in the subcutaneous layer, which is composed of adipose tissue and also loose areolar connective tissue that you can see in between all these fat. And since the epidermis doesn't have blood vessels in it, what nourishes those cells in the epidermis are the nutrients and oxygen provided by the 
blood vessels that are found within the dermis. So, the lower layers of the epidermis is supplied by the blood vessels found in the dermis. And at the same time, the waste products produced by the epidermal cells diffuse back to the dermal tissue fluids and then they go into the blood vessels found within the dermis. Now, let's have a closer look at the epidermis of our skin. And we have all this representing the epidermis. And as you can see, we have several layers of cells. And the epidermis of our skin has several layers. It has either four layers or it has five layers. And in this specific case, the epidermis has four layers. And I can assure you that has four layers because I see hair. And when we have hair in the skin, that classifies this skin as thin skin. Thin skin is present in all the different areas of our body that we can find hair. Thick skin, on the other hand, is present in the areas of our body that we do not have hair. And the areas that we do not find hair are the palms of our hands and the soles of our feet. Those are areas that we do not have hair. Consequently, there we have thick skin. And thick skin has one extra layer. It has five layers. So what you can conclude is that thin skin is thinner because it has one less layer than the thick skin. Now, what are the layers that make up the epidermis? And their names are stratum, corneum, stratum, lucidum, stratum, granulosum, stratum, spinosum, and stratum basale. So these are the five layers that can be found in the epidermis. And as you can see, each of these layers starts with the word stratum because the word stratus means layer in Latin. And since each of these layers of the epidermis starts with the word stratum, you can easily recall that the epidermis is a stratified epithelium. Now, here we have five different layers. And I told you that we only have five layers in thick skin. And the layer that is present in thick skin is the stratum lucidum. So, stratum lucidum is a layer that's only present in thick skin. Thin skin does not have stratum lucidum. And consequently, thin skin has only four layers. Now, you need to keep in mind that thin skin does not have stratum lucidum, but it does have hair. So, the skin has hair and it is considered thin skin, or the skin has stratum lucidum, and then it is considered thick skin. Now, how can you easily remember these five layers in order? And a way I always tell students to remember is by remembering come let's get sun burned stratum corneum stratum lucidum stratum granulosum stratum spinosum and stratum basale those are the five layers of your epidermis and the only detail you need to keep in mind is that you either have stratum lucidum or you have hair you cannot have both now, the basal layer of the epidermis, as the name implies, is the layer of cells that you have at the base. Basal layer. So, stratum basale is the layer of cells that you have at the base of the epidermis. And the cells that you have at the base of the epidermis are the cells that are the closest ones to the blood vessels found in the dermis. Look at this right here. These are the cells in the stratum basale of the epidermis. And here we have the blood vessels in the dermis. Consequently, these cells found in the stratum basale of the epidermis, they are the closest ones to where nutrition is, to all the oxygen that is being delivered by the blood vessels in the dermis. Consequently, in the stratum basale of the epidermis, we find live cells. And these cells are capable of undergoing cell division. They are capable of undergoing mitosis. And what happens is that the great majority of the cells that we find in the stratum basale of the epidermis have this columnar or cuboidal shape, and they are called keratinocytes. And keratinocytes are named keratinocytes because we find keratin in them. And these keratinocytes at the basal layer of the epidermis, they are the closest ones 
to where oxygen and nutrients are found. And that's why those keratinocytes are capable of undergoing cell division. They are capable of undergoing mitosis and give rise to new keratinocytes. And since this basal layer, the stratum basale of the epidermis, is where we find the keratinocytes undergoing mitosis, undergoing cell division, this stratum basale is where we have the germination, the creation of new cells. And that's the reason why the stratum basale is also referred as germinative layer of the epidermis. Now, the great majority of the cells in the stratum basale is keratinocytes. And then we have a few percentage of these keratinocytes being special ones, and they are keratinocyte stem cells. And a stem cell is a cell that's capable of dividing throughout its entire life. And then when this keratinocyte stem cell divides, it gives rise to a new keratinocyte and also gives rise to a new keratinocyte stem cell. This keratinocyte that was resulting from the keratinocyte stem cell division will also divide a few more times, giving rise to new keratinocytes. However, it will get to a point that it will not be able to divide any longer. It's not like a stem cell. Now look at this, guys. Can you notice that this stratum basale of the epidermis is very packed with cells? And as I mentioned, the great majority of these cells that we find in the stratum basale are keratinocytes. Now, if these keratinocytes are constantly dividing, we can conclude that there will not be enough space for all of them in the stratum basale. So what we see is that the new keratinocytes push the older keratinocytes upwards. And as the older keratinocytes move upwards, what happens? These older keratinocytes are getting, are moving further away from where nutrition is, right? So as the older keratinocytes are moving upwards, closer to the surface of the epidermis, these older keratinocytes, they are deprived of nutrients and they die. Now, these cells are named keratinocytes because they have keratin in them. When they are here at the stratum basale, we barely have any keratin. But as they move upwards, they have more and more keratin in them. And keratin is a hard, dry protein that helps our epidermis to be able to resist trauma, to resist friction. So it makes sense that as we get closer to the surface of the skin, the cells are becoming more and more keratinized, which means that the cells are becoming harder because as we get closer to the surface of the body, we want to have a nice hard layer to protect us. So as these cells move upward, they have more keratin in them and they are getting further away from where nourishment is and they are dying. So you can expect a change in the shape of the cells. And this change in shape of the cells and also what we find within the cells and in the extracellular matrix will be what make us define the specific layer of the epidermis we are in. So we have the basal layer of the epidermis with live keratinocytes. And these keratinocytes, they can divide and they give rise to other keratinocytes, right? And the older keratinocytes are pushed upwards. And these keratinocytes, since they are fairly close to the blood supply, they are still alive. But as they move upward, they are getting further away from the blood supply, from the nourishment, and they have more and more keratin. And then it gets to a point that these cells are more rounded and we barely can see a nucleus in them. So you can see that we have two different layers here. One of the layers, the one that has several cells with nucleus in them, is what we call stratum spinosum. And the other layer that has these more rounded cells, and if we look at them, we would find several granules inside the cells. These rows of cells will make up the stratum granulosum. And lastly, all the way to the top, we have very flat keratinocytes filled up with keratin, because they're the ones further away, right? So they have lots of keratin on them and they shed from the body. And this top layer of flat dead cells is what we call stratum corneum. Now, basically, this renewal of the epidermis happens every eight weeks. So what I'm telling you is that the skin that you're seeing in the mirror right now will not be the same skin that you will see two months from now, because every eight weeks, all the layers of the epidermis are renewed. And sometimes you see that whitish dust in your house, and you can see like some white flakes when you rub your skin, right? That is actually the dead keratinocytes in the stratum corneum that are being shed from the body. Now, if this model did not have any hair in it, what we'd see is another layer of clear flat cells 
and this layer would be in between the stratum corneum and the stratum granulosum. And that layer of four to six rows of clear, flat, dead keratinocytes would represent the stratum lucidum. Now, there is something very interesting about the stratum granulosum layer of our epidermis. The stratum granulosum was named stratum granulosum because when we look at those cells, we see that there are granules inside the cells. And since these cells are not close enough to where nutrition and oxygen are found, which is in the dermis, these cells are undergoing apoptosis. And because of that, these cells look flattened out and their nucleus is not really apparent. Now, the presence of these granules in the cells of the stratum granulosum is very important because when we see these granules, we know two things are happening. One of them is that some of these granules are proteins involved with the keratinization of the cell. So when we see these specific granules, we know we automatically connect with the fact that those cells will start to have the hardcore keratinization happening. And the second group of granules that we see, they are involved with the secretion of lipids that is going in between these cells. Now, you need to remember that the cells in the stratum granulosum, as we said before, they are undergoing apoptosis, right? And cells that undergo apoptosis, they do not have really cell junctions holding them together because they are dying. So even though when we look here at the cells of the stratum spinosum and the stratum basale, these cells are alive and these cells are held together by cell junctions, right? And the specific cell junction that we find in between the cells of the stratum granulosum and stratum basale of our skin is named desmosomes. And desmosomes, to refresh our mind, are the cell junctions that they look like a Velcro, right? So they are like a button-shaped Velcro structure that on the inside of the cell associates with keratin. And when we have this type of structure connecting cells, that gives the tissue lots of strength and also flexibility. So literally, when we put our skin under tension, these cells in the stratum spinosum and also in the stratum basale, they are not pulled apart because they are held together by desmosomes. Now, when we go to the superficial layers of our epidermis, the cells are dying or they are already dead. So we don't have desmosomes anymore. Now, what holds these cells together is this lipid layer, this lipid extracellular matrix that's produced by the granules within the cells of the stratum granulosum. And literally, this lipid extracellular matrix works as a cement between bricks in a wall. So it holds the cells together. And it holds the cells of the stratum granulosum together, as well as the cells of the stratum lucidum and the stratum corneum, which are the layers of our skin above the stratum granulosum. So when we have this lipid layer, guys, remember, lipid is waterproof. So now we have a waterproof layer in our skin. And this layer of lipid in between the cells of the stratum granulosum, stratum lucidum, and stratum corneum is what makes our skin waterproof. So water from the external environment doesn't go into our body because it doesn't pass the waterproof layer and water that we have within our body does not leave our body because it cannot cross the waterproof lipid layer we have in between the cells. Now, very importantly, there is a specific type of lipid that we find in this lipid layer that when we expose our skin to the sun, to the UV rays, this lipid is converted into a form of vitamin D. And this form of vitamin D is absorbed by the body. It goes into the blood circulation and it reaches the liver and the kidneys. And mostly in the kidneys, we have this form of vitamin D that was produced in the skin being converted into the most active form of vitamin D, which is called calcitriol. And that's why we say that one of the functions of our skin is the synthesis of vitamin D.
because we need to have this specific lipid found between the cells of our skin to be converted by the sunlight into a form of vitamin D that then travels through our circulatory system and ends up in the liver and kidneys and then it is finally converted into the most active form of vitamin D. Now, we have other cells in the epidermis of our skin. One of them is called melanocytes. And what happens is that melanocytes, they have this dendritic shape. And they are basically found in between the keratinocytes found in the stratum basale of the epidermis. You see? And the melanocytes, they have these projections that they go upwards towards the stratum spinosum of the epidermis. And melanocytes are named melanocytes because they produce melanin. And melanin is a pigment that gives our skin color. So depending on the amount of melanin, we have a different skin color. And this amount and also type of melanin is determined genetically. Now, these melanocytes are found in the stratum basale. As you can conclude, they will have access to the nourishment provided by the dermis, by the blood vessels found in the dermis. And melanocytes, yes, they will be able to divide. And if you have like a little concentration of melanocyte in a specific area of your skin, that's what we call a mole. If these melanocytes, they go crazy and they divide like nonstop and they're able to go down into the dermis and reach different organs and tissues of our body, that is what you know as melanoma, which is the most aggressive type of skin cancer. So melanocytes are found in the basal layer, in the stratum basale of the epidermis. They're responsible for the melanin production and they give our skin the specific color it has. Melanocytes have this dendritic, this process that they extend up toward the stratum spinosum of our skin. Another cell we find in our epidermis is named Merkel cells. And the Merkel cells are also found in the stratum basale, in between the keratinocytes. And Merkel cells, they are responsible for allowing us to sense light touch. So when someone touches the surface of our skin, we can sense it because of the presence of Merkel cells. And since these Merkel cells are receptors for light touch, what happens is that these Merkel cells are associated with what we call Merkel discs which are these discs that are connected to a sensory neuron, which will take this sensory information towards the central nervous system, and then we become aware that someone touched the surface of our skin. So Merkel cells are another type of cells found in the stratum basale of our skin. Lastly, the cell I would like to talk to you about is named dendritic cell. And the dendritic cell was known before as Langerhans cells. And these Langerhans cells, also called dendritic cells, also called intraepidermal macrophages, they are the macrophages present in our epidermis. So what happens is that when we look within the layers of our epidermis, we find this dendritic cell, also named Langerhans cells, and this cell is basically part of the immune system. And it is responsible for protecting our skin if something, some pathogen, try to invade our epidermis. Obviously, this dendritic cell, this Langerhans cell, needs to be within a layer of the epidermis that's close enough to where nourishment is found. So we find Langerhans cells, these dendritic cells, which are part of the immune system, within the stratum spinosum of the epidermis. And as I said, these Langerhans cells, they are intraepidermal macrophages. And macrophages, they come from monocytes that were passing by in the blood circulation. And these specific monocytes decide to leave the blood circulation and goes into the tissue. And when this monocyte goes into the tissue, in this case goes into the epidermis, then it differentiates into this intraepidermal macrophage, also known as Langerhans cell, also known as dendritic cell. So basically, these dendritic cells are the gatekeepers of our skin. If any pathogen tries to invade our skin, these dendritic cells will identify it and they will move into the lymphatics and that will activate a specific immune response, which tells us that our body is aware that something was trying to invade it. Now, based on my beautiful drawing, you can clearly see that the dendritic cells, the gatekeepers of our skin, are not in the stratum basale, right? They are a little above the stratum basale. They are within the stratum spinosum. 
So even though the stratum basale is the layer of the epidermis, that's the closest one to where oxygen and nutrients are, the dendritic cells are not all the way there. They are a little above. And there is a reason for that. If they are the gatekeepers of the skin and they're all the way down, that would not be very helpful. So the langevin cells, the dendritic cells, they are within the stratum spinosum, which is the layer that's close enough to where nourishment, oxygen, nutrients are found, but is not all the way at the bottom. Because you need to agree with me, that would not be a very smart approach. Another detail you can notice is that the melanocytes, they are found within the stratum basale. So they are all the way at the bottom. But they have these projections that they move upwards. And these projections are found within the stratum spinosum as well. And these projections of the melanocytes are the ones that will be delivering the melanin, the pigment, to these keratinocytes that are found within this stratum spinosum. And what happens is that we have the production of melanin to protect our skin from UV damage. And then it's very interesting that people go sunbathing and they believe that it's a very nice, cool thing to be done. And they get tanned. But they only get tanned because their body, their melanocytes, were producing more melanin to protect the skin cells from UV radiation. So clearly, that is your body trying to protect you from a not very smart decision. And the longer you are in the sun, the tanner you will get. And that is a consequence of your body trying to protect you. Now, we have people that they do have melanocytes in their skin, but those melanocytes do not produce melanin. And when that happens is what we call albinism. So an albino person is very light, has a very light skin because their melanocytes, even though they are present in the skin, they're not capable of producing melanin. Now, there is another situation in which the immune system of the person destroys the melanocytes in the skin. And when your immune system attacks your own body, that is what we call an autoimmune disease. And the autoimmune disease at which the immune system destroys the melanocytes in the skin and creates, as a consequence, those white patches in the skin is what you know as vitiligo. So in a person with vitiligo, literally the melanocytes that were in the skin at that specific spot that is white now, they were destroyed. And that is usually caused by the immune system of the person killing the melanocytes that were there. Now, let's focus on the dermis of our skin. And this is what represents the dermis. As you can see, the dermis is much thicker than the epidermis. And I like to look at the dermis in this model because this shows you better this area right here. So, can you notice that this part right here is the dermis? And this is the area that's in contact with the bottom layer of the epidermis, right? Now, if you're able to look at this in 3D, you'd see that these are little bumps in the dermis. And when we look at this in 3D, what happens is that those bumps look like nipples. And a nipple-like structure in anatomy is called papilla. Now, that papilla, that nipple-shaped structure, belongs to the dermis. So how do you think we name this area in the dermis? We name those dermal papilla. In the dermal papilla, they are very important because let's imagine if you had here the epidermis and underneath you had the dermis. So here's the epidermis and here is the dermis. And the surface in between the epidermis and the dermis, this area right here, would be flat. What happened if you had a friction? If you had the friction, those two layers, the epidermis and the dermis, they would easily split apart. And that does not happen. And that does not happen because we have these bumps. We have this dermal papilla. So the epidermis and the dermis, they interlock. And even if you have friction, they do not split apart unless you have lots of friction. Then they do separate. And then there is accumulation of interstitial fluid between the epidermis and the dermis. And you know how that is called? That's called having a blister. 
So literally, when you have a blister that tells you that your epidermis and your dermis were separated, and then interstitial fluid was accumulated in between these two layers of the skin. Now, look at this. We just defined that the top part of the dermis, these indentations, that we see here in the dermis, that they look like nipples, are named dermal papilla, correct? So each of these bumps is a dermal papilla. And the plural for dermal papilla, so if you're referring to more than one dermal papilla, you say dermal papillae. So you have one extra letter, which means that you have more than one dermal papilla. Now, all this is the dermis. And the dermis is subdivided into two layers. So let's put an imaginary line right here. This is the top layer of the dermis, and here we have the bottom layer of the dermis. Now, guys, the top layer of the dermis is in contact. It includes the dermal papilla. Consequently, the top layer of the dermis is named papillary layer. It has the word papilla in it. And the bottom layer of the dermis is named reticular layer. Now, the reticular layer is named reticular layer because it has lots of those reticular fibers, right? And reticular fibers are one of the types of fibers produced by fibroblasts. And since we have lots of reticular fibers in the bottom part of the dermis, that layer was named reticular layer. Now, as I mentioned before, the dermis is connective tissue. The great majority of the dermis is dense, irregular connective tissue. And it has to be regular so it can resist tension in all different directions. Now, do you remember what is the most famous, the most popular cell in the connective tissue? The most popular cell is the fibroblast. And fibroblasts were named fibroblasts because they produce fibers. So obviously, if we have fibroblasts in the dermis, we will have the production of reticular fibers, collagen fibers, and elastic fibers. And depending on the area of the body, we will have a different arrangement, a different amount of each of these fibers. Now, what we need to remember, which is very, very important that I already said so many times, is that since the dermis is a connective tissue, it will have blood vessels. So, blood vessels are found in connective tissue because connective tissue is a vascularized tissue. And here you have a very good view of the blood vessels found in the dermis. And you can see that the reticular layer as well as the papillary layer, they have blood vessels, obviously, because both of these layers of the dermis are connective tissue. And also, when we look at the hypodermis, which is not part of the skin, then we are talking about the subcutaneous tissue, we will see blood vessels as well. You can see all of them here. Remember, the hypodermis is underneath the dermis. Hypo means below. And in the hypodermis, we have lots of adipocytes. We have lots of adipose tissue. And adipose tissue is also one type of connective tissue. Consequently, it is vascularized. Now it's time for us to look at some accessory structures of our skin. And the first thing I'd like to point out is that in this model, this part right here basically shows us the cross-section of some of the structures we find in the skin. And this side shows us the 3D version of these structures. And the first accessory structure I believe it's important to look at is the hair. Now it seems like in this model, the hairs were shaved, but I want to make sure that the hairs are sticking out. They are on the surface of the skin. And there we go. This portion of the hair that sticks out of the skin is what we call hair shaft. And this portion right here that goes all the way deep into the dermis and even reaches the hypodermis, which is not part of the skin because the hypodermis is not cutaneous tissue, it's subcutaneous tissue, right? All this is called hair follicle. Now, this portion of the hair follicle right here at the bottom that is a little wider, that looks like a bulb, 
is what we call hair bulb. Now, you see this portion of the hair that I'm trying to make it brownish, you know, going over the model picture right here. All this right here is what we call hair root. So, the hair root, in other words, is basically the hair shaft that is within the skin. So, all this portion that I colored in brown is what we call hair root. Now, look at this. This is the epidermis of our skin. And this right here is the stratum basale of the epidermis. And the majority of the cells that we find in the stratum basale of the epidermis are keratinocytes. Now, look at this. These are all keratinocytes. Can you notice that these keratinocytes are lining the wall of the hair follicle? And they are going all the way down, all the way down into the dermis and then hypodermis. Guys, this is very, very important in case we have injuries that remove the epidermal part of our skin. So if we have a partial thickness injury in our skin, and we lose the epidermis of our skin. If we have keratinocytes in the lower parts of the dermis, also reaching the hypodermis, that means that we can have epidermal regeneration from those keratinocytes. For me, this is so bright. It's like thinking ahead, right? So we have these keratinocytes going all the way down, basically lining the wall of the hair follicle. Now, remember that I told you that a nipple-like structure was named papilla in anatomy? Now, look at this structure that we have right here, right there. That structure, if you're able to really zoom in and see it in 3D, we would see that that looks like a nipple. And a nipple in anatomy is called papilla, but this is the nipple of the hair. Consequently, that is called hair papilla. Now, the hair papilla is very, very important because if you really look into it, you can see that you have blood vessels arriving and leaving. And these blood vessels are bringing nutrition and removing waste from cells that are found here at the hair papilla. And these cells right here at the hair papilla, they undergo mitosis and they are capable of proliferating. And they are called the germinative layer of the hair. Those cells in the germinative layer of their hair papilla, they are the ones that divide and make our hair grow. Now, our hair has color. So, what happens is that in between these cells that are dividing and making up our hair root and hair shaft, we have cells that produce pigment. And cells that produce pigment are named melanocytes. And depending on the pigment that the melanocytes are producing, we have different hair colors. Now, when we get older and we start having white hair, that just tells us that the melanocytes in the germinative layer of the hair papilla, it stopped working, it stopped producing pigment, and then our hair is gray. Now, can you notice that we have this right here that basically comes and hugs the hair follicle? This that I'm calling right now is a smooth muscle. And a smooth muscle is a muscle that we do not have conscious control over it. A smooth muscle is a muscle that contracts automatically. It's under the control of the autonomic nervous system. And what happens is that when this muscle contracts, our hair sticks up and becomes erect. And that's why this muscle was named erector pili muscle. The word pili means hair, and erector is the Latin word for erector, right? Because erection means that it's standing up. So the erector pili muscle basically is the goosebumps muscle, right? Every time the erector pili muscle contracts, our hair sticks up, and then we have goosebumps. And we can have goosebumps for different reasons. We have goosebumps because we are frightened. We have goosebumps because we are cold. We have goosebumps because we are extremely happy. Independent of the reason, if our hair is sticking up, it's because the erector pili muscle is contracting. And obviously, for this muscle to contract, we would need to have nerve fibers from motor neurons arriving here, stimulating the contraction of this smooth muscle. But we'll talk more about the different types of neurons and how muscle contraction happens later on in the semester. Now, another thing we see associated with the hair is this gland. And this gland is called sebaceous gland. 
And sebaceous glands are always associated with the hair. And if you look here, this is a section, a cross section of a sebaceous gland. And as it is a gland, it is epithelial tissue, right? So you can see that these cells are packed together because that is the definition of an epithelial tissue. And a sebaceous gland produces sebum. And sebum is basically an oily secretion. So the cells in the sebaceous gland, they produce sebum. And the sebum goes towards the hair root. And then it goes all the way up, covering the hair shaft and also the surface of the skin. And since it is an oily secretion, the easy way to remember that sebaceous glands are always associated with the hair is that if you have very oily hair, your sebaceous glands are working very well. Now, even though we are not always happy because we have oily hair or we have oily skin, sebum is very good because it improves the waterproofing of the skin and it stops the skin from drying out. We have like very thin hair in our face, right? And if you go into the area that's between the nostril and the cheeks and you rub there, you feel that oily secretion. That is sebum. And besides helping with waterproofing and preventing the skin from drying out, sebum also has some antibacterial properties. So it's something that's natural from our body that helps us to prevent bacterial infections in our skin. And if we wash our hands very frequently, for example, or our face very frequently, we are actually removing some of the antibacterial properties that sebum was providing to our skin. Another accessory structure found in our skin is the sweat gland. We all know that we sweat, right? So obviously the sweat glands, they are in our skin and specifically they are deep in the dermis. They are within the reticular layer of the dermis. And this right here is a cross section of the sweat gland. And you can see that this gland is coiled up basically, right? You can see there the cross section. And this side shows you the 3D version of the sweat gland. Now, as the name says, the sweat gland will produce sweat. And this sweat then will go into a sweat gland duct. It will pass through the sweat gland pore and then it will cover the skin surface. Now, why do we produce sweat? And sweat is produced to help regulate our body temperature. Sweat is produced in response to an increase in body temperature. And the thinking behind this is very interesting. When we have sweat covering our skin surface, that sweat needs to be evaporated. And in order for that sweat to evaporate, we have lots of heat energy being released from the surface of our body. And that causes the evaporation of the sweat. And when this happens, that helps with the body temperature regulation. Now the issue comes when we keep cleaning the sweat that is over the surface of our skin. Because if we keep removing it, we are not allowing our body to use heat energy to cause the evaporation of the sweat. And consequently, we are not allowing our body to regulate body temperature via the evaporation of the sweat. Now, besides sweat being released due to an increase in body temperature, sweat can also be released due to emotional stress. So if we are anxious, if we are feeling embarrassed, or if we are afraid of embarrassing ourselves, our body also produces and releases sweat. And that is what you know as cold sweat. So it is the same sweat gland, but the sweat is being released for a different reason. Now, can you notice here that we have blood vessels arriving at the glandular portion of the sweat gland and also we have blood vessels leaving? Yes, we have blood vessels there because sweat is actually made from the blood plasma. So water, sodium and chloride ions, urea, all the components in the sweat are filtered out of the blood plasma. And when the sweat is made, it goes into the sweat gland duct all the way up, passes through the sweat gland pore, and then covers the surface of our skin. And if you ever had the opportunity to taste your sweat, you probably notice that it is a little salty, right? And that's because of the presence of the sodium and chloride in the sweat. Now, 
since we have ions and we have urea in the sweat, and also you probably noticed that when someone eats lots of garlic, sometimes they smell like garlic, or if someone drinks lots and lots of alcohol, you basically can smell the alcohol in their skin. And that is because those components were filtered out of the blood and they are being released in the sweat. And that's how you do to remember that besides body temperature regulation, sweat also helps with waste removal. Now, the fancy name for sweat gland is sudoriferous gland because sudor means sweat. Now, the sudoriferous or sweat gland is also called equine sweat gland. And if you recall, equine is one of the three types of exocrine glands, right? And the equine gland is the one that the glandular cell releases the product via exocytosis, equine exocytosis. Now, I'm pointing this out because we have another sweat gland. And this other sweat gland is called apocrine sweat gland. And the apocrine sweat gland is also known as modified sweat gland or scent gland. And if a gland has the name of scent gland, you probably know where I'm going, right? This gland is the one that makes us smelly if we don't clean our underarms and our groin area. And this beautiful scent gland is also a coiled up tubular gland, but this one releases its secretion into the hair follicle. And as you can see, this scent gland is much bigger than the regular equine sweat gland. And as the apocrine sweat gland or scent gland or modified sweat gland secretion is produced, it's released into the hair follicle and basically it follows the same pathway as the hair root and then it spreads over the skin surface. Now, the secretion released by the apocrine sweat gland, besides having the regular sweat composition, it also has lipids and proteins. So basically, it is like a thick sweat. And this secretion doesn't really smell. It is odorless. The problem is that when this thick sweat goes over the surface of our skin, bacteria that are there get very happy and they metabolize the lipids and the proteins in that beautiful secretion. And the resultant waste product is what is very smelly. So unwashed armpits, unwashed genitals, they do have a particular smell because of the bacteria metabolizing the apocrine sweat gland secretion. And you probably notice that even though little kids do not use deodorant, they do not have smelly armpits. And the reason for that is because these sand glands, these apocrine sweat glands, they only start working when we reach puberty. On the other hand, the equine sweat glands, the sudoriferous glands, they start working as soon as we are born. Now, I mentioned before that the equine sweat gland was named equine sweat gland because it releases its secretion via exocytosis. And when we have a gland releasing the secretion into a duct via exocytosis, that specific gland is named a cream or marrow cream, right? We can use either name. Now, we have here the other sweat gland that receives the name of apocrine sweat gland. And the apocrine sweat gland was named apocrine sweat gland because years ago, it was believed that the apocrine sweat gland secretion was secreted in an apocrine manner, which is what we call when the cell that's producing the secretion loses the apical surface, right? So that's apocrine. But it turns out that now that more studies were done, we know that the apocrine sweat gland also releases its secretion via exocytosis. However, since the name apocrine sweat gland is being used for such a long time, it was decided that even though the apocrine sweat gland releases its secretion via exocytosis, it would still be named apocrine sweat gland. Now it's time for us to look at the sensory nerve receptors we have in our skin. 
The first one I will cover is the Merkel cells. And we talked about Merkel cells when I was covering the epidermis. Merkel cells, they are found in the basal layer of the epidermis. So they are found at the stratum basale. And Merkel cells are activated in response to very light touch. And when this light touch stimulus happens, the Merkel cells detect it. And then this is transferred to a Merkel disc that's found within the dermis. And then this stimulus is taken away by a sensory neuron, right? And then this stimulus is taken toward the central nervous system and we become aware of this light touch sensation in our skin. Now, besides the Merkel discs, we have receptors that also detect touch. And these receptors are right here. And they are named tactile corpuscle. And another name for this receptor is Meissner corpuscle. So the way I like to remember the name of this receptor is by saying instead of Meissner corpuscle, I say Meissner corpuscle. Because when I say Meissner corpuscle, I remember minor touch. So Meissner corpuscle for minor touch. And what happens is that this tactile corpuscle detects minor touch. So it detects when something touches the surface of our skin. But as you can expect, since it is deeper down in the skin when we compare to the Merkel cell, the Merkel cell detects even lighter touches than the Meissner corpuscle. Now, another sensory receptor we find in the skin is the lamellated corpuscle. And the lamellated corpuscle was named lamellated because it has several layers, it has several lamina. And when we look at it, we see that it has several layers right there. You see, it looks like an onion. And as you can notice, the lamellated corpuscle is all the way down in the hypodermis. And since the lamellated corpuscle is within the hypodermis, is all the way down, what will cause the activation of the sensory receptor will be pressure. So we need to press deep enough strong enough so this receptor that's all the way down in the hypodermis is activated. So the lamellated corpuscle detects pressure. And the other name for the lamellated corpuscle is Pacinian corpuscle. And then you remember, P, Pacinian, P for pressure. Now, have you noticed that even if something doesn't touch your skin, but it moves the hair, the hair shaft, that is on the surface of your skin, you can feel it. The only reason you feel that is because we have a sensory receptor that wraps around the hair follicle. And the name of this sensory receptor is root hair plexus. And the name of this receptor literally tells us what it does. A plexus is an interconnection. It is a network. So this receptor is an interconnection that is at the level of the hair root. Consequently, anything that moves our hair will cause an stimulus that will be detected by this receptor that's wrapped around the hair root. And this sensory information will be taken towards our central nervous system and we become aware that something moved our hair. Now, all these sensory receptors I just mentioned, they detect mechanical changes in the skin, or in the hair position. So since all these sensory receptors, they detect mechanical deformation, mechanical changes, they fall under a category called mechanoreceptors. Now, I'm pretty sure that you are aware that we can feel pain in our skin and we can feel if the environment is hot or cold. We can feel if we touch something hot or if we touch something cold. We can feel if something is making us itchy. We can feel if someone is tickling us. And all these sensations that I just mentioned, they are detected by different types of free nerve endings. And they are named free nerve endings because the ending of the nerve fiber is free of any wrapping. So you just have the ending of the nerve fiber here arriving at different parts of the dermis and they can do their detection. If you compare the ending of the free nerve endings, that part right there, and the ending that a tactile receptor has, look, it's this one, or the ending that a lamellated corpuscle has, which is this one, you can easily notice that the lamellated corpuscle and the tactile receptor, they have this very fancy ending. And the free nerve endings, they do not have that. They just have their ending free. So again, free nerve endings, 
in our skin are responsible for detecting pain sensation, and the specific name for the receptor that detects pain sensation is nociceptor. Free nerve endings in our skin are responsible for detecting temperature, and the specific name that a sensory receptor receives when it detects temperature is thermoreceptor. So when we are touching something hot, that hot sensation is detected by the thermoreceptor. Now, if we're touching something extremely hot, and it's so hot, it is painful. The painful sensation is detected by the nociceptor. So, you can conclude that our nociceptors are very, very clever. If we do anything that is causing tissue damage, if we are submitting our body to something that is extremely hot, extremely cold, if we are pressing on the skin hard enough that is starting to damage the tissue, or we are stretching the skin too much, that will activate nociceptors and we will feel pain. Now, can you notice that I drew the nociceptors in green? And they are in the dermis. We do not have nociceptors in the epidermis. And that's why partial thickness damage to the skin is so painful. Because if you have an injury that was capable of reaching the dermis level, you are really activating the nociceptors. And that's why second degree burns, also known as partial thickness burns, are so painful. Because in second degree burns, there is the burn, the loss of the epidermis, and also part of the dermis. And when that happens, basically the nociceptors are being stimulated all the time. They are completely exposed and they are sending the pain stimulus non-stop. Now a third degree burn, which is also known as a full thickness burn, destroys the epidermis, the underlying dermis, and also the subcutaneous tissue. And when that happens, since the dermis was lost, the nociceptors that would be stimulated and would cause pain are not present anymore. And that's why third degree burns are not as painful as second degree burns. And with this, we finish the integumentary system. Please let me know if you have any questions and I will see you in lecture. Bye.